Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 67 of the Stanford MLSA seminar series. Uh, today, I'm joined by Tatsu. Say hi. Hello. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, Tree. Hi, everyone. And Michael. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode and, 67 uh, of the Stanford MLSA seminar series. Uh, Michael, today, you... I'm joined by Tatsu. Say hi. Michael, can you close your, your YouTube? Yeah, Hello. That's sorry, a good idea. Muted. All right, classic live streaming uh, bugs, no worries. Um, yeah, so we've been on hiatus for a little bit now, but I'm happy to welcome everybody back. Um, especially excited this quarter, we've partnered with CS324 at Stanford. So CS324 is the Advances in Foundation Models um, class, and we've partnered and we're very excited to offer a kind of a special limited series on foundation models. Um, so if you're in that class, you know, say hi in the YouTube chat. You can also say, say hi in Discord. Um, the, the way that these guest lectures will kind of work is we'll have kind of a 20 to 30 minute talk, uh, and then we'll uh, transition to kind of a podcast style Q and A and, uh, there we'll take, uh, live questions from YouTube, from the YouTube chat, from, from discord. Um, so, you know, launch out any questions that you'd like, um, and we'll, we'll be sure to, to answer them. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, let me introduce our speaker. So our speaker today is going to be Tree Dow. Tree is a PhD student at Stanford, advised by Chris Ray and Stefano Ehrman. Uh, he's done a lot of great work, some of which you'll be hearing about today. Uh, he's won a number of awards, uh, best papers, uh, best paper runner up, uh, spotlights, orals, whatever you name it, um, Tree has won it. Uh, and his work has been deployed uh, at, at a number of large companies, um, large internet companies, large social media companies, you name it, uh, he's done it. Um, so with that, uh, Tree, go ahead and take it away. All right. Th thank you, Dan. That's a very kind introduction. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here today at the MLSS seminar in NCS uh, 324. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, our, our work, Flash Attention. Uh, this is actually joint work with Dan here, um, Stefano, Atri, and, and Chris. So uh, let's let's dive right in. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit uh, first about the motivation why we want to do this stuff. And uh, our motivation for a while um, has been we want to model longer sequences. Um, why do we want to do that? So this might seem obvious to some people, but not, might not be obvious to other people. So the way we think about this is that there are three main reasons why we want to model longer sequences. And these are grounded on three um, applications. And Chris uh, and and I and Dan and, and so on wrote a blog post with a somewhat provocative title called, called um, Can Longer Sequences Help Take the Next Leap in AI? So the three reasons we're, we're thinking about longer sequences are, uh, first, they could help us bring uh, bridge new capabilities. So the anchoring application here is NLP, where um, if we want to understand things like books and plays and instruction manuals, um, we want our models to have context laying way beyond what's currently uh, possible. The second reason is we call this closing the reality gap. So the anchoring application here is computer vision, where we found that um, if you model images at higher resolution, this generally just leads to better and more robust insight. And modeling higher resolution images usually translates to longer sequences, if you're familiar with things like patching in, in a vision transformer. And the third reason um, we're excited about this is th this could open up a bunch of new areas. So TAM series, audio, video, medical images, all of these can be modeled as, as sequences, but they're sequences of really long uh, 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 elements. So really long sequences up to millions of, of TAM steps. So right now, these uh, we don't have the, the, the modeling capability to deal with sequences of, of this length. So the question is, can we scale current models such as transformers to longer sequences? And um, this is a problem that many, many researchers have been working on for several years. And, and uh, with flash retention, we, we take one step towards um, uh, allowing transformers to model longer sequences. And I'll talk about how. So this is the, the motivation. And let's say even if you don't care about any of this, um, let's say you just want to play with, with GPT-3. So as an example, um, let's say you've been arguing with your buddy that uh, Rocky Road is the best ice cream flavor. And you go on GPT-3 and you say, hey, can you write me a 2,000-word essay on why Rocky Road is the best ice cream flavor? 
And GPT-3 might refuse to do so, not because uh, it doesn't like Rocky Road, it's because um, usually they would have a maximum length of around 2,000 tokens. So that's a bummer. Um, well, there's been recent advances in the sense that uh, um, things like ChatGPT has context length of up to 4K, but that's that take a long time to, to come out, and we, we want to go even longer than that. Okay, so can we just brute force, um, just train on longer sequences? Um, and that could work for a little bit, especially for, uh, for smaller models, but if you want to scale it up, it's actually quite challenging. The reason is that attention, which is at the heart of transformer, don't scale too well uh, with respect to sequence length. So here I'm showing um, a plot of training speed. So the bars um, represent training speed, higher is better. And the blue one here is training speed uh, with context length 2000. And the green one is training speed with context length um, 8000. And these are all normalized so that they have the same uh, number of, uh, of tokens. So as in you, uh, increase context length by four four times, but you decrease batch size by, by four so that uh, everything is normalized. And you see that when you increase context length by four times, this is on Megatron LM, which is considered state-of-the-art training uh, library from NVIDIA. Tons of people are using this to train large models. And so you see that when you increase context length by 4K, uh, pretty much your training efficiency dropped by half. Um, so first of all, speed is definitely a factor. And second of all, as you, you see on the right, uh, that uh, up to some point, you're going to run out of memory. So out of memory, CUDA error is a, is a thing that we, um, uh, many of us have to deal with. So, okay, so speed and memory are the main issues. And in this talk, I'll, um, I'll give um, some ideas of how flash attention uh, Uh, tackle these issues. Sequences with transformer. Um, what are some of the challenges right now? With flash attention, as I will show here, um, this actually allows to train quite a bit faster than Megatron LM. So with sequence length 2K is about 1.5x faster than Megatron LM, which um, is considered state of the art. And with context length 8K, it's actually not that much slower than 2K, and it doesn't run out of memory. So this is great. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but just as a teaser, uh, flash attention will allow you to train things uh, faster and with longer context. Okay, so here's an e overview of, of the talk. Um, so we want to make attention faster and more memory efficient. The trick we, we're going to use is called IO aware tiling, and that's going to allow us to go faster with less memory and will yield higher quality model. So how do we do this? Um, so we use two techniques. One is called tiling and the other is called recomputation. And these techniques will allow us to reduce uh, GPU memory IOs, read and write. This makes attention go about, let's say three times faster. Uh, it makes it way more memory efficient, 10 to 20 X. And the nice thing is that this is exact attention. So we're not doing any approximation here. Um, it'll give you the right answer, the same answer as before. Um, so this yields, this allows to train, for example, the fastest bird instance uh, on, on cloud instances um, on the very competitive benchmark MLPerf. Um, this is on both MLPerf 2.0 and 2.1 last year. Um, and even more excitingly, it allows us to train for longer sequences. So up to, let's say, 16K tokens length, uh, tokens. And this, this use high quality model. And, uh, and, and we'll go into details about this. So we've been really happy to see um, just massive adoption of flash attention uh, in such a short time after we released it. Um, so right now it's in PyTorch nightly. It's going to be a part of PyTorch 2.0 to be released in, in March. Um, folks at OpenAI have re-implemented it. Folks at Meta have, have re-implemented it. Um, people have integrated in Hugging Phase, uh, Mosaic ML. People have re-implemented in JAX. Uh, folks at Stability AI are using it to train diffusion models. So those are the models that generate pretty images that you, you've been seeing on Twitter. Um, so we, we've been really happy to see this uh, getting adopted pretty widely. So the, the talk uh, is going to have four parts. So I'll, I'll go over a little bit of background. Um, then I'll talk about the method itself, which actually conceptually is not that complicated. And then I'll talk about some empirical validation. And finally, I'll conclude with some exciting future directions. 
Okay, so let's dive in the uh, the, the background. So as I, I mentioned, um, we're going to focus on on transformers. So I know a lot of you guys are familiar with transformers. This is just so that uh, we're on the same page in terms of terminology and notation and so on. So the transformer architecture is now the, the dominant architecture in, in many, many areas. Um, and pretty much all, almost all foundation models are built um, with transformers. So they, uh, transformer has a bunch of encoder blocks or decoder blocks, and each block uh, has has two main layers. There's the attention layer and there's the MLP layer. And we'll focus on the attention layer because um, scaling attention to longer sequences is, is quite challenging. Um, scaling MLP to longer sequences is not so bad. So we'll focus on, on attention. And just a quick primer on attention. I know a lot of you guys are familiar with this. So just so that we're, we're on the same page in terms of notation. Okay. So here, by attention, we take a, as input these uh, matrices um, Q, K, and V, or query, key, and value. And these, I'm just illustrating one head of, of attention, if you're familiar with multi-head attention. Um, so we take in Q, K, and V, and they all have shape N by D, where N is the sequence length, and D is the head dimension. So think of N as 2K, or maybe even 8K. Uh, and think of D as 64, 128. Those are the common head dimensions. So we take in Q, K, and V. First, we multiply Q and K to get this matrix A of size N by N. Um, then we might mask out some entries. So this shows up if you uh, have key padding or if you're doing causal language modeling like GPT, where you mask out half of the entries. And we apply softmax so that we, each row is normalized. Optionally, you might drop out some of the entries and then you multiply with V and you get an output O. Um, and as you notice that the inputs and outputs Q, K, V, and O actually have pretty small size, N by D. So these are okay. They don't take that much space, but the intermediate uh, matrices usually have size N by N. Um, so it's quadratic in, in, in the sequence length. That means that naively, if you just implement this as is, it's going to require repeated read and write to slow GPU memory. So I'll call it GPU memory HPM, a high bandwidth memory. That's the term for uh, the GPU memory, uh, for example, on A100. And this makes it hard to scale to long sequences because it has quadratic scaling. So if you, let's say, double the, the sequence length N, then uh, you would uh, increase the read and write by four times. So that really hurts. Like this makes it really hard to, to scale to long sequences. Um, so we take inspiration from, from a bunch of work that, that, that people have, have done. Uh, one paper I particularly like is this paper from uh, MLSIS, um, I think last year or the year before, it's called Data Movement is All You Need. So they, they study Transformer, how to optimize it. And they noticed that, hey, actually a lot of time is being spent on they call data movement, which essentially is reading and writing to GPU memory. So this is a little bit surprising. It's not that you spend a lot of time in computation. You're actually spending a lot of time on reading and writing to memory. So of course we take inspiration from this. And as a, as a preview, um, by reducing um, GPU read and write, we can significantly speed this up. So here's a, here's a teaser. So here's an example of attention on GPT-2. Um, on the left, I'm plotting the just the standard PyTorch implementation where you have the matmol, masking, softmax, dropout, and then another matmol. And you notice that these steps in the middle, masking, softmax, and dropout, actually take uh, most the most amount of time. Whereas the matmol, which is where a lot of computation happens, actually does not take that much time. So this is the somewhat counterintuitive observation. And as you will see with fast retention, we can fuse everything together. Uh, with a little bit of a twist so to scale it up. There's been tons and tons and tons of work on approximating attention. And um, and it's been really exciting. There's so many methods. So um, I would classify them as either with uh, sparse approximation or low rank approximation. So you take the attention matrix and you either, um, if you want to do sparse uh, attention, you would zero out a bunch of entries. Or if you want to do low rank approximation, you would factor the attention matrix into two low rank uh, parts. And they all 
tend to trade quality for speed. Um, so as a result, they haven't been, they haven't seen widespread adoption. Um, these ideas are all great. They're, they're really fun papers to read, but they haven't been widely adopted. Uh, because if you talk to people, the two reasons they, they might not want to use these things, one is that, um, oh, they have to sacrifice quality. And two, in terms of speed, uh, some of them might not be that actually that much faster uh, walk clock time. So theoretically, they could be faster, but walk clock time, when you actually train models, they don't actually um, speed things up. Um, um, so our, our take is that we should focus on designing hardware-aware algorithms. So we want to design algorithms that play well with hardware so that we get actual wall clock speed up. And we don't want any approximation. So we want to look for a fast, memory efficient, and exact attention algorithm. Um, so that's going to, because our, our tech is that we, we need to look, uh, design hardware where algorithm so we're going to take a look at, at the hardware just a little bit. And I'll focus here on the, the, the GPU. Hey, Tree, uh, just to um, interrupt you a second, your screen share was It's going to translate to other architectures as well. Yeah. Uh, I think your, your screen share went black for a second. OK, let me. Is the audio still, still OK? okay? Uh, it's a little right. bit, um, it's a little choppy. Okay, let me. Okay, let me share again. All right. Uh, Michael and Tati, do you want to turn your videos off just to help Tree's internet okay. connection? Always a fun part of uh, of of live streaming. Um, okay, so while I'm here, uh, I think we so we got a question from the audience that we can answer. So good in the audience is asking uh, just to make sure the computation graph does include batch dim for simplification. That's correct. Um, so in the in the figure that was kind of explaining attention. Uh, uh, trio is emitting both the number of heads in, in attention and also the batch. Um, that's just for simplicity of um, drawing. Uh, Michael, I think we also got a question from somebody, somebody in class. Um, so if you want to uh, read that one out, we can um, have a bit of a discussion. Uh, I'm sure Tree will have opinions, but just while we are waiting for him to uh, get his um, slides back up. Michael, do you want to unmute and read that question out from the class? Yeah. Okay. That sounds great. Yeah. So there's this really interesting question about the need for a longer context training. Um, we've heard that there are ways that people train or fine tune models based on sort of, let's say you have a very long, I guess, document, like a book, and you can break it down into shorter sentences with shorter length and then sort of do training over the shorter lengths and aggregate it somehow. So like, what would this longer sequence, I guess, approach bring that this current way of truncation cannot? Uh, yeah, I think that's a, you know, a really good discussion. Um, you know, as an academic from uh, one perspective, it's kind of just, you know, nicer to, if a uh, tree, you yeah. have opinions I'm about sure. this question, if you, if yeah, you heard go, it. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, this is an excellent question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I think uh, there's a bunch of approaches. Yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, you know, we don't know what the right uh, thing to do. Maybe the combination of things. So yeah. So people have uh, have worked on things like uh, chopping it up, um, the the context, and then summarizing each piece, um, and then hopefully having the transformer able to attend to um, smaller piece. That's also worked um, to some extent. So. Yeah, as an academic, as 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 Dan mentioned, um, we still want eventually we still want um, everything to. We still want to model uh, long sequences, and and there are many many ways to do it. And let's say right now for for flash attention, we're pushing in this direction. Let's say, hey, what if we don't do any approximation? How far can we go? It turns out you can go pretty far, um, yeah, much further than than we have thought possible before. But at some point, we might need approximation. At some point, we might need different 
uh, we might need to chop things up and summarize each each piece, or we might need entirely different um, models, right? Um, and that's that's the exciting thing. We don't know what the right approach is, um, but tons of people, tons of smart people are working on it, so it's a really exciting area. Yeah. Definitely. All right. So, yeah. So so I'll, I'll um so I'll get back to um talking a little bit about the hardware. So we just need to understand just a little bit about the hardware, um, actually not that much. And if you wanna uh, understand more, I highly recommend this blog post by Horace He, who's a PyTorch developer. So he wrote an excellent blog post uh, on making deep learning go brr on, um, from first principles. So he talks about GPUs and this applies to things like TPUs and other accelerators as well. So um, the main thing we want to understand from the hardware perspective is that um, there's a memory hierarchy, and I'll, 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 I'll talk about that. So the GPU here, I'm, I'm drawing, let's say your machine has eight GPUs, um, and each GPU is going to have a large pool of HBM, or what you think of as main memory. So if you're on an A100, this main memory is about 40 gigs or, or 80 gigs. And then you have these uh, compute units and SRAM. So SRAM is much, much smaller, but much faster. And um, when you do any computation, the inputs will start out being in HBM. It's going to get loaded to SRAM close to the compute unit. The compute unit is going to do matrix multiply or, or softmax or whatnot. Uh, and then it's going to get written back to HBM. So uh, there's always this data transfer between HBM and, and SRAM. And this is all happening within the GPU. Even within the GPU, you have to kind of uh, move data back and forth between the memory unit, the HBM, and the compute unit. So there's this asymmetry in the memory hierarchy. So the GPU HBM is quite large and is a, is a model of engineering. It's actually quite fast in absolute terms. But relative to SRAM, SRAM is maybe three orders of magnitude smaller, but uh, an order of magnitude uh, faster, something like that. So what we our goal here is we're going to exploit this asymmetry. Uh, the main insight is we can exploit the memory asymmetry in order to get speed up. And the way we do that is with IO awareness, uh, which is which just means accounting for reads and writes to different levels of memory. And I'll, I'll talk uh, uh, about exactly how to do that. Okay, so that's the the, the background. Uh, and now I'll talk about flash attention our method to uh, exploit memory uh, hierarchy asymmetry in order to speed up attention. Okay, so uh, the the oldest trick in the book for for exploiting memory uh, memory hierarchy is is called tiling or computing things by block. And this has been around since um, I guess the seventies or eighties when people started implementing matrix multiply. Right. So we want to compute things by block so that we can load everything uh, into uh, from a small block into the fast SRAM. I think of it as a fast cache. And hopefully we can do things just in the cache. Uh, and so we don't have to repeatedly reading and writing to the slow memory. But there are two challenges with respect to um, uh, computing attentions by block. And challenge number one is that uh, attention has this softmax step that um, seems to couple the entire row. So you, it seems like you would need at least an entire row, maybe a block of row in order to do uh, softmax. And the second challenge is that uh, if we want to train these models, you need to compute gradient. And so in the backward pass to compute the gradient, uh, you seems like you would need the large attention matrix from the forward pass in order to compute the gradient uh, in the backward pass. And so we use classical techniques to address these challenges. So technique number one is tiling. So as I mentioned, this just means you restructure the algorithm so that you can load things block by block from HBM to SRAM to compute attention. And I'll talk uh, in more details about how, how we do this. And the, uh, the uh, second way we address uh, the challenge number two is recomputation. Again, this is a very old technique. Um, it's actually very simple. Uh, we just don't store attention the attention matrix from the forward pass. We recompute it in the backward pass. And in terms of implementation, we have a few scooter kernels so that we get fine grained control of memory accesses. But turns out uh, you know, a bunch of people have re-implemented this in different 
um, ways. This one implement implementation in, in Triton, which is a Python-like language, while retaining this fine-grained control of memory accesses. So there's now several implementations of flash attention. Um, so was, yeah, we're really happy to, to see that. Okay, so now I'll talk uh, in more details about these two techniques that we use. So technique number one is, is tiling. And the idea is to decompose large softmax into smaller ones by scaling. And we just need to know a tiny bit of math. So this is the only bit of math in this, this talk. So let's say you want to compute softmax of attention and you break attention into two pieces, A1 and A2. So um, to compute softmax of the, the, the concatenated row A1 and A2, turns out you can first compute softmax of A1 then compute softmax of A2, and then up to some scaling factor alpha and beta, um, you can scale the local results to get the right uh, global result. And these alpha and beta, these are just scale of constants that you can figure out. These are if you if you looked at softmax before, these are just essentially like the the scaling factor for the denominator. So how do we use this idea in in attention? So in attention, you would take softmax of you break the attention into two. A1 and A2, you take softmax of that and you multiply by two uh, blocks of value, V1 and V2. So here you just um, do the softmax of A1 times V1, and then softmax of A2 times V2. Those are all local computation. And then you add them up, up to some scaling uh, alpha and beta, you'll get the right answer. So uh, you can work, at, work out exactly what these alpha and betas are. They essentially uh, the denominator of the the softmax, uh, but I, I won't I won't show it here just um, just so that we we have some space. And so the the um, actual um, procedure is relatively simple. So we're going to load inputs uh, by blocks from HBM to SRAM. So HBM here um, on the diagram I'm showing in green, and we load things by block. Here I'm showing in orange into SRAM, and so we're going to just compute attention with respect to that block. That's the uh, orange uh, square here. And we never materialize the big N by N matrix. So everything is done block by block. We don't materialize the big matrix. And we update the output in HBM. And as long as we have the right scaling, we'll get the right answer. So this is the part where flash attention, there's no approximation. So with the right scaling, you get the, the right answer. So here is uh, an animation actually made by, by Francisco Massa. This could help some people. Uh, if it doesn't help uh, you, that's that's fine. Uh, so I'm just going to play the, the animation. Uh, we're doing things block by block. Here the on the left is the, the query uh, queue. On the top is the key K. And on the right here is the value V. And we're going to iterate conceptually block by block of attention and to update the output. So we're moving block by block. Conceptually, we're just computing things block by block. And with the right scaling, you, re you get the right answer. So if that animation help, uh, help you, that's great. If not, that's fine too. Okay, so that's the first technique, tiling. Um, so we can deal with the softmax challenge. The second technique to deal with uh, black, uh, the backward pass is, is even simpler conceptually. So uh, what we want is we want to recompute uh, the attention uh, in the backward pass. So the only thing we have to, to be careful about is we want to recompute, but we want to, don't want to write down any big N by N matrix. So what that means is um, we're going to recompute uh, the attention with respect to this small block when things are already in SRAM. So we never write anything down uh, that's that we don't need in, in HBM. So we do uh, all the recomputation within that one block on, on, on chip. And so that, uh, that saves us a bunch of memory reads and writes. So here I'm comparing uh, standard attention and flash attention uh, in terms of flops and in terms of memory reads and writes. So uh, we, because we do recomputation, we actually incur more flops, so floating point op operations. Uh, but that saves us a bunch of memory reads and writes. So here um, we're doing like nine, nine x fewer reads and writes. And as a result, we run about six times faster. So Again, counterintuitively, uh, even we do more computation, as long as it, we can reduce memory reads read and writes, um, things go faster. So that's the 
uh, that's kind of the takeaway. You can speed up the backward pass even if you have to increase flops. So those are the two ideas of, of flash attention. Uh, again, these ideas are pretty uh, well established. Uh, with just a little bit of a, a twist, we can make these work for, for attention. So we can use tiling and we can use recomputation. So now I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the empirical validation. So we, we, we're going to validate two things. One is that we get speed up, um, and hopefully that leads to faster end-to-end -end training for transformers. Um, and second, we get memory savings. So um, the memory will scale linearly in sequence length instead of quadratically. And that means that we can train with longer sequences and that leads to higher quality models. So, uh, so for just the attention module here, I'm showing the speed up. Uh, that's, the, um, that's the bar. Those, those are the, uh, the bars representing the speed up of flash attention compared to a standard implementation in PyTorch. Um, for different sequence lengths and for different scenarios, like whether you have dropout masking or not, uh, things like that. And generally we see about two to four X speed up on, let's say A100. We have a bunch of other benchmarks for different GPUs um, and we tend to see around the same speed up two to four X. So this is really nice. We get two to four X speed up with no approximation. And in terms of memory, so we, uh, here I'm plotting the memory reduction so how many times, um, um, how many, uh, what is the factor of memory saved? And so we save a bunch of memory. Um, so that's the takeaway up to 10 to 20 X essentially, because memory is now we, we never need to write down the big N by N matrix. So the memory requirement is on the order of N instead of order, on the order of N square. So the larger the sequence length, the more we save memory. Okay, so how does this, do if you train things end to end. So this is a result we, we're really excited about. So this is a MLPerf benchmark. It's a, actually a really competitive benchmark uh, because companies like NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, and so on, they spend lots and lots of engineering resources um, to make the models go fast for this benchmark. So the benchmark is you train a model, let's say a BERT model um, fr from the same, starting from the same check, point on the same data, how fast do you train it to hit the a certain target accuracy? And so, for example, N uh, NVIDIA has spent uh, lots and lots of engineering resources to make theirs really fast. So compared to the widely used hugging face implementation, the NVIDIA implementation is about three times faster. So that's, that's really amazing. Um, the nice thing is, even with these simple ideas, flash attention can actually speed up um, the super optimized implementation from, from NVIDIA. So this outperforms the previous MLPerf record by 15%. And for context, this is already about three times faster than the widely used hugging face BERT. So this is a result we're, we're very excited about. We show that these simple ideas um, can actually speed up some of the most optimized code um, you know, from vendors. So that's, that's for BERT. Um, as I mentioned, we can, uh, this also use speed up when you think, train things like uh, GP3. So here, uh, I, I mentioned this before, here's the uh, training speed for different GP3 models, let's say from 125 million to 2.7 billion. Um, and for different sequence length, 2K and, and 8K. And as I mentioned, M Megatron LM is uh, this state-of-the-art training uh, library. So again, tons of engineering resources there. Um, and with flash attention, we're able to speed that up quite a bit. On this 2K sequence length, we're about 1.5x faster. And on 8K sequence length, we're about um, two times faster. And in some, some cases, uh, when Megatron LM runs out of memory, flash attention actually just run just fine. Um, so actually, as of three hours ago, uh, flash attention has been integrated into Megatron LM. So uh, the folks at, at NVIDIA have been very receptive of about work as well. So this, this is amazing. So now if you use the latest commit from Megatron LM, you could actually, there's an option you can just enable to run flash attention. Um, so this is great. So we we can we can speed up things like BERT training, GP3 training. These are all uh, foundation models that are used in a bunch of places. Okay, so uh, so we can speed up the training 
Um, I want to argue that you can then train on longer sequences and lead, that leads to higher quality models. Um, so here is an example. So we train GPT-3 with longer context comparing 2K context and 8K context. And um, with longer sequences, um, things go a little bit slower, but that leads to lower perplexity, in this case, mean better model. Um, and actually training with 8K with flash attention is actually faster than training um, Megatron LM at at 2K, okay. again, normalized for the same number of tokens. And that leads to better, uh, better models. Uh, so that's kind of pre-training um, evaluation. For downstream evaluation, we can also do things like long document classification. So here are two data sets. Um, Mimic is classifying um, medical documents and the other one is classifying legal documents. So these are uh, pretty long documents. And we see that um, consistently, uh, when you increase the context length for these models, you improve the quality. So in this case, um, you classify more accurately. And so this, um, we we can now train things, train models with sequence length up to 16K or 64K. So he, he's a fun challenge that was set up by folks at, at Google called Long Range Arena. So there's this task called PathX here uh, represented by an image black and white image, and you're supposed to classify whether the two dots are connected. The thing is you're supposed to take in pixels and not use patches. That means the sequence length is really, really long, up to 16K. And previously, transformers uh, either didn't train or the approximation was uh, not accurate enough. So none of them uh, could do better than random. And so with flash attention, we essentially just take transformer, we train it, we just run it with on, on PathX, and it actually does better than random. So for the first time. Um, and if you use things like block sparse, which um, you combine block sparse attention with flash attention, you can actually scale up to path 256, where the sequence length is 64K. So this is really fun, right? Uh, with flash attention, we can ha we have the first transformer that can solve path X um, and even scale to sequence length 64K. Okay, so now now I'll conclude with uh, some exciting directions. Some some of this uh, we're 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 looking at some of this. We're collaborating with other folks. So um, uh, it's been really fun working with other folks from PyTorch team, Hugging Face, Jackson, and, and folks at OpenAI who do doing Triton to get flash attention to more people's hands. So as as I mentioned, um, is in PyTorch nightly now, which is probably going to be in PyTorch 2.0 release in March. Uh, Folks at OpenAI have been re-implemented in Triton and so on, and, and uh, it's been integrated in a bunch of, uh, of libraries. And uh, so on the technical side, um, we're thinking about IO aware inference and distributed training. Uh, lots of folks, are, lots of folks are do are thinking about this. So I think uh, you know the, some of the same techniques could um, could help speed up inference and distributed training as well. And more generally, we want to bring more hardware aware thinking into other operations. Um, um, so attention is just one piece, uh, one piece of the puzzle, and there are many, many other operations that could benefit from more hardware-oriented thinking when you design algorithms. And on the AI side, we're just excited about what we can do with longer sequences. So maybe we can train language model with 8K context length. So actually, we've been collaborating with some companies who are training language model with 8K or 16K context length and, th and things like that. Uh, if you can model high-resolution images, um, what can you do, say, on medical imaging, um, on astronomy, and things like that? So there are a bunch of exciting work to, to do. And so I'll, I'll conclude here, and I'll summarize the flash attention here. Uh, there are three points where uh, we want to make attention. We, want, we, we make attention fast, um, make attention memory efficient, and we uh, do exact attention, so no approximation. And the two main algorithmic ideas, tiling and recomputation. And the upshot is that you can train model faster and you can train you can train better models with longer sequences. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your for your attention. And uh, I'll, yeah, I guess um, we can open up for, for questions and discussion.
Yeah, excellent, excellent question. So I didn't want to write too much math in in this in the slide. I just want to I don't say oh the talk only has two 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 lines of math. Yeah, actually the alpha and beta are not that hard to compute. You just have to look at that. These are uh, dependent on uh, on each block, so these are not pre-computed. So um, so these alpha is essentially the um, the softmax denominator of the first block divided by the softmax denominator of the entire block. So alpha and beta, um, you can work it out um, exactly. There's a little bit of subtlety because of numerical stability. So to compute things numerically stably, um, you need to subtract the max from each block as well. So the paper goes into a little bit more detail uh, about this, uh, but the main idea is you can work out exactly what alpha and beta are here. And uh, these are just scalar, so you can you can just compute and and keep them around, and uh, by rescaling, you get the right answer. Thanks. Um, I want to acknowledge that I compute. I uh, I did another major streaming sin, was which is I forgot to unmute my microphone before talking. So thank you for everybody in the chat who caught that. Um, I'm seeing a, a couple other questions. Uh, interesting. People are interested in. Um, I, I think you you had a little bit of this at the end of your slides about um, do these benefits also apply to inference? So I know you started to look at that. Do you want to speak about inference um, and that that question for a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Um, so for for inference, so um, one type of inference is uh, you just run the forward pass. Um, on, in, uh, on the on the model, so things like bird inference, where you just feed in a sequence and you just get a you want to get a bunch of embeddings, and and there it uh, directly benefits from flash attention. So in fact, I think uh, folks at Meta have been using flash attention for uh, for for this. Um, so it just speeds up bird inference. Um, so for GPT, things like iterated decoding. So it it helps the first part where you're processing. You're given a prompt. Let's say the prompt is hey, write me an essay or write me a poem on blah, or here's a document, summarize it. So the very first part of the processing the prompt, um, which just means you run the forward pass through the, through the model. So uh, then flash attention would help um, there directly. On the iterative decoding side, so this is something we're thinking about. So flash attention itself um, might not be that helpful because there the, uh, the, the bottleneck is slightly different. The bottleneck, you no longer have the uh, big N by N matrix. Uh, the attention matrix there is just one by N. So the bottleneck there is actually loading the um, KV cache. The, yeah, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with, with iterative decoding. Um, but we're thinking, we're thinking about, we've been talking to folks about it. Some of the, main, uh, some of the same ideas um, could still apply things like breaking things up into block, that seems useful. And I know some, some people are thinking about it and, and implement it in their, in their library. So hopefully in a couple months, we'll, we'll see something. Great. Uh, I also see a couple of questions in the YouTube chat about kind of approximations to attention. So, so I wanted to group a couple together um, and ask you about them. So Eric Hahn is asking, is wondering on longer context lengths, is it possible to train maybe an embedding layer that compresses your sequence length into a, uh, into a shorter sequence length? Um, Yap, uh, uh, Yap Dian Ong is wondering for what about other variants of non softmax attention? Um, do the same ideas or, or similar ideas apply? Yeah, so, oh, oh great questions. Um, yeah, approximate uh, attention, I think, is probably going to be useful when you scale up to long, even longer sequences beyond, you know, let's say, 16K or so. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of great ideas there. Folks have been working on it for I, think, I, I guess five years now, uh, when attention uh, since attention came out. So yeah, uh, great suggestions. You can probably do some sort of uh, sequence length reduction. So there are things like Linformer that does sequence length projection that could help with with embedding. Um, um, for non softmax, um, I think the same idea would apply. Uh, it might be it might apply even uh, more simply because uh, yeah, one of the main difficulty was the softmax coupling the entire row so we had to do some scaling to get the right answer if there's no coupling let's say instead of softmax you just have relu then things might be even easier so is the, the you can just apply tiling um directly and so you you would still process things by by block 
but you don't need to do this rescaling thing with uh, with softmax. So for if for non for other nonlinearity things might be even easier. So yeah, there's a bunch of really exciting work. Lots of smart people are working on approximate uh, attention. So yeah, that's a really promising area that hopefully we'll um, we'll see a bunch of results soon. Great. Um, I'm seeing a couple questions that are appearing in the YouTube chat and and in the class. So I'll ask one of them and then pass it on to Michael for, for him to ask some questions from the chat. Um, one of them that I think is is quite interesting is, do you foresee large improvements to these large language models um, as they start using much larger context lengths? Is there maybe something you've seen in, in industry or in practice? Or um, if you just had to speculate on your own, what, what do you think the, the path forward is uh, for for the language models, yeah. So I, I yeah, I think uh, that's certainly a direction that people are pushing towards. So even folks at OpenAI, you know, as first when they re release GPT three, that has context length two K, and when they release, uh, I think um, the Vinci two or Chat GPT, they they want a Chat GPT to have just a longer memory, so they increase context length to four K. Um, so even just things like Chat, if you want the Chat bot to remember a bunch of things you said before, that's certainly uh, is a, a necessity to have longer context length. Uh, and beyond that, I think there's a bunch of uh, really exciting applications in things like multimodal models. So models dealing with both text and images where, um, so now beyond text, you have images, which are a bunch of patches. Um, so if you concatenate everything together, the sequences would get actually really long. And so uh, it would be really exciting if we can train models that understand both text and images at the same time. I'm sure there's a bunch of exciting work there. Um, there are folks doing things like uh, user interactions, so um, beyond just chatbots. So uh, models would interact with user. And so if you want multi-turn interaction, um, you kind of need to have this long context length. So um, I see, I, I think there's going to be a bunch of exciting progress, uh, not just in just training pure language model, but things like multi-model, things like taking user action, user interaction into account. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really exciting area. And uh, I, I think uh, machine learning system is right now one of, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm biased, but I, I think it's a very exciting area to, to work in because there's, there's so much excitement on the AI side and there's a lot that you can do on the system side that, that directly um, opens up uh, new capabilities for these AI models. Right. You know, I, I totally agree with you. Of course, I'm also biased. Um, let's see. Let me transition to Michael now. Uh, Michael, you want to uh, maybe you can you know get some questions from the class, and uh, we can we can talk about them with Sri. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, Sri, for the amazing uh, talk. Lots of interesting sort of implications here with long sequence modeling. Um, I have a pretty I got a pretty interesting question from someone in the class. They asked, is there another implication of lower memory usage in flash attention, which is related to being able to get more gradient updates out of training in this way, such that you can like train, let's say, larger chinchilla optimal models with existing data sets? Have you thought about this? Oh, that's a, that's a great point. I um, I honestly have not thought too carefully about that, but that, that seems like a great point. So um, we've seen that um, so the way I, I interpret the question is okay now we can use um, less memory for model training that means maybe we can you know increase batch size or train for longer and and, and things like that um, yeah that seems like a good idea um, I think someone should do that or maybe someone has done that already um, yeah so this is why it's exciting uh, you know you can do more systems -y work that that benefits AI and then that certainly opens up a you know a bunch of new opportunities. Um, I guess, so another question related to sort of the implementation of flash attention is how does one determine the block size? Is this dependent on SRAM or is this a hyperparameter? Yeah, um, so uh, it depends on the SRAM size. Um, so right now we just do the simple thing where we say, hey, we're going to set the, the, uh, the block size to be uh, as large as possible while still fitting into in in, in SRAM. Um, I've talked to some folks who suggest uh, doing dynamic block sizing, and that might that might improve things. Right now, we do just simple things like we just set the block size to e be equal to either one twenty eight or two fifty six, whichever fits. So we we did the simple thing. I'm sure you can do something more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. 
And then, so do you think that this is another question? It's pretty interesting, but do you think that there is sort of compatibility where you can use sort of flash intention and also alternative matrix multiplications together, uh, such as, for example, those identified by the recent alpha tensor work? Oh yeah, so so yeah, that's excellent work from 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 DeepMind. Yeah, it's just, it's, uh, this is exciting because it's a it's a feedback loop where the AI part actually improves the system part, and system improvement leads to AI improvement. So yeah, um, so right now flash attention is kind of AI improvements leads to systems improvement. So it's an exciting time. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, let's see. Okay, here's a interesting question, I guess. Um, so there's apparently this paper called self-attention does not need O of n squared memory. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you've come across it. And so yeah. I guess, yeah, would just like to clarify like, okay, how does flash attention or like the sort of premise of self-attention requires quadratic, I guess, time and compute um, to reconcile with, I guess, like this paper. And can you clarify sort of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's excellent work from folks at, at Google. Uh -huh. Um, and, 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 and we had a, ch a chat with them, right? So, um, so we, so for a while people were all saying, Hey, uh, attention is a, there's a bottleneck in terms of memory and speed. And in terms of speed, I mentioned, you can approximate things in terms of memory. Um, the way you would alleviate memory bottleneck is you either do things row by row or block by block so that you don't materialize the entire matrix. Um, so the paper, that paper is great. So they. They uh, they say, hey, we can do things block by block, and for the forward pass, uh, you know, it works relatively well. Um, so without um, kind of reducing the the I/O, so they can, they say, hey, we can reduce the memory requirement uh, by trading off uh, speed. So it's actually a little bit slower. And so uh, with flash retention, we take that idea a little bit further, and we say, hey, um, we can do things block by block. And we can reduce uh, memory reads to writes as well. So we get both memory reduction and we get both uh, speed up. So of course our work builds on a bunch of other. Um, a bunch of uh, other credits built on. Cool, thanks. And then I guess maybe one more question. Um, I guess you can, you can use this as an opportunity to both sort of expand more on the future directions and perhaps plug the work as well. Um, but sort of two related questions. One of them is related to sort of, okay, like for different GPU chips, uh, is the block size the only thing that or parameter that I need to adjust if I want to sort of, I don't know, apply flash attention to, let's say a new sort of GPU that comes out. Um, and also sort of relatedly to that, like, are there any drawbacks of using flash attention or should we just be all of our models, whenever we have self-attention, transformers, all the stuff underlying these large pre-trained or foundation models, should they just all be using flash attention from now on? Yeah, so so great, great question. So regarding block size, yes. So uh, right now we're kind of hard code things a little bit. Like we did kind of the simple thing. We say, hey, if you're running GPU with this amount of SRAM, then we set the block size to this. Um, I'm sure you can do better than that. So. Uh, folks have done things like auto tuning, so they try different block sizes and see what's what's faster. Um, yeah, there's there's a bunch of things you can do. We kind of did the the simple thing, and that worked well enough for us. Um, for these uh, for device uh, designs, so um, you know how does that factor in with? Let's say you want to do, design um, different accelerators, and it seems like the trend is you actually want more SRAM so that you can fit the, more things in in SRAM. Um, so things like TPUs actually have way more SRAM than 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 TPU uh, GPUs. Um, so that's an that's an area where a things like block size play a role. Things like SRAM size plays a role. Um, as for the drawback, so um, yeah, I don't see that much drawback. Of course, I'm I'm, I'm biased. Um, so it you know, computes the the same things faster and more memory efficient. So uh, that's why lots of folks have been adopting it. I think one drawback at the beginning was that it's a little bit less flexible in the sense that um, if you if you want the attention matrix itself and if you're going to do a bunch of things to the attention matrix, uh, then it's a little bit harder to work with uh, with flash attention because we combine everything together. Um, so if you have weird ideas about oh I'm going to take the attention matrix and I'm going to split it up like this and I'm going to multiply this part like that, 
uh, then it's a little bit harder. And of course, you should uh, prototype in, in PyTorch, right? Uh, but the nice thing is uh, folks at OpenAI, like Phil Tillet, um, started implementing flash attention in um, in Triton, which is a, a Python-like language. And that uh, that's, makes it way more accessible to a bunch more folks who want to play with it and who wants to change it in different ways. So um, now with, with Triton, I think it's... Uh, quite a bit more flexible in the sense that you can go in and change stuff. And let's say you don't like softmax, you want to try something else. Um, you, you can go and you'll go in the Triton implementation and, and just, just swap it out. So, uh, uh, so uh, that's an exciting direction. Maybe with uh, a compiler's advancement in the future, uh, you can just write PyTorch code and everything would be, uh, the, the compilers would do all this work for you. We're not quite there yet, but hopefully in maybe a couple of years, we'll, we'll get there. I have a not follow up, but a question related to that. What about the energy efficiency of the resulting thing? Like for low power devices or something, you were saying you have to do more ops, but they're just more, you know, they're they're sequenced in the right way. So you get the shorter wall clock time. But in terms of the energy consumption for like how many ops you actually have to do, uh, is the energy consumption higher under flash attention? Yeah. So I don't, the short answer is I don't know. know. Um, and I can speculate. Um, so yeah, you know, I I haven't played with low, uh, low powered devices. What I've heard is usually uh, like memory accesses are way more memory inten uh, energy intensive than mm -hmm. compute. Um, so I would suspect that even though we do more compute, if we reduce memory, that you would still get memory saving. But again, I'm not I'm not an an, an expert. Um, so that's my that's my speculation. That makes sense. Cool. Well, we are reaching the end of the hour. Um, I want to uh, say thank you to Tree for for giving a great talk and uh, you know welcoming us back in style. We we were on hiatus for for a couple months. Um, and thank you, of course, to all the students in CS three twenty four, everybody on on YouTube for for watching us. Um, it's always much more fun and much more lively when we get a uh, nice audience participation. Um, there's a lot of questions in the in the chat that we didn't get to. Um, but uh, I think uh, if you scroll back in the video, I'm sure Tree's email was somewhere in those slides, or I think if you Google him, uh, his email is available online. So if you have more questions, um, uh, feel free to reach out to Tree directly. Uh, I think if you're at Stanford, you, you can probably get on the Slack as well. Um, so uh, that we're gonna go ahead and, and wrap up um, to today's episode of the seminar. Um, thank you to our guests, um, Michael and Tatsu, who I'll show on screen now. So you know, wave, wave to everyone. Um, thanks to Michael. Thanks to Tatsu. Um, great co-host today. Um, so if you want to hear more about the seminar, um, you can go to our website, mlsys.stanford.edu. Um, if you want to hear about CS324, uh, there is also a website that I don't know off the top of my head, but I think you'll find on Google or, um, or in various ways. Uh, we do have a mailing list for a website. So if you go to our website, you can sign up for our mailing list. Um, there's no spam. We send you approximately one or two emails a week. Um, so, uh, just to tell you about who the speaker is and, uh, when I remember to, I also send a reminder about the talk about to start. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, uh, you can hit that little bell icon down there to get notified when we go live and when we post videos. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that is, that's a wrap on today's episode. And next week we're going to have Su Jong, who, who was a, um, you know, he is a, an alumni of Chris's lab. So he. He's a, he's a good friend, and now he's a professor at ETH, um, and uh, he's doing a lot of fun things. So next week, we're going to have So on to talk about a lot of really fun, interesting things about networking and uh, training distributed models and more. Um, so with that, we'll uh, wave goodbye and uh, call it for, for, for the day. Thank you.